You are listening to the Cycling Podcast, added to the France in association with Rafa. The fastest closing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as a partner EF Education First and Canyon Charam. Stage 7, today we're in chalon sur saône Well, fellas, the tour giveth and the tour taketh away. Where are we, Lionel? Well, the tour is giving right now because uh, we're in the courtyard of the wonderful Lanex. Uh, not really a hotel, more a restaurant with rooms and our lodgings for this evening. I'm uh, looking forward to a very nice meal. Uh, my room is absolutely wonderful. It mine's a little bit nicer, actually, because I saw them first. So <laughs> I've got the balcony. Oh, I've got a balcony. Well, I don't have a balcony, but oh, I, I have I kind of a mezzanine, you know. Oh. Uh, I don't know why it's because the bed is in, uh, downstairs. So I don't know if I'm going to visit the mezzanine, but it, it oh. exists. I've got a balcony <laughs> and a mezzanine. <laughs> so the, the hierarchy on the cycling podcast is being clearly established by who has the nicest room, right? <laughs> It was more established by who gets gets uh, into the hotel first, mm. actually. Lionel. Well, you buffalo your way in through the door, don't you, eh? I tried yeah. to. I'm, I'm I mean, struggling in with all is, my Is bags. the hierarchy of the tour, uh, you know, uh, reflects the uh, is reflected by the quality of the hotel rooms? I mean, well, there's been debate. This is a whole other subject, and this will be the subject of Kilometre Zero, a very interesting Kilometre Zero, for which I did an interview with a listener of the podcast today. It was really interesting, so... Listen out for that. Um, how long can we just keep chat, keep flannelling <laughs> like this before we get onto the stage? Because it was, I mean, after yesterday's thriller, today was a bit of a snooze fest, wasn't it? Well, it was, and it was entirely predictable, wasn't it? Let's have the tail of the attack for stage seven. It was the longest of the race, 230 kilometres. And after the difficulty of yesterday, uh, not just the difficult finish, but all the climbs that came before it, uh, looking at the road book this morning, it was pretty predictable that it would be very similar, in fact, to the stages at the same point in the race last year. We went from Belfort to chalon sur saone and, well, we saw two very familiar faces in the breakaway, Stefan Rossetto of Cofidis and Johan Afredo of Wanti Gobert, and they were out in front for 218 of those 230 kilometres, and they were almost daring the peloton to catch them at numerous points. A gap came down to about three inches at one stage, and yet they still <laughs> stayed away. I mean, it was a, it really was a day where n- no one really was racing, were they? I got a text message from, uh, from you, Lionel, at 1459. I'll have to edit it a wee bit. They're not even pedalling. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing was, they covered I've, I've the first. I've a word. They covered the first half of the stage in three and three quarter hours. Um, it was six hours in all. Okay, not unusual f- f- to have a long day in the saddle, but it was uh, pretty action-free. Really, the only action was a uh, split in the peloton with about 30 kilometres to go and, and finding out that Nardo Quintana, Dan Martin, and Wout van Aert were caught behind the split. I just wanted to point out to you because you, you said the only action was the split, but TJ Van Garderen crashed. Well, we're uh, we're okay, okay, excuse me. <laughs> Are you reading over my shoulder here? I don't know, it's but, but maybe I thought you might have been sleeping when that happened. Well, so. no, I, I, did, I did see that. I was going to add, add that in at the end. Um, but that all came back together, uh, well, mainly because Movistar uh, had some riders to chase and uh, Dan Martin had Rui Costa to chase. Uh, so it all came down to a sprint finish, and it was a pretty good, clean sprint. Caleb Ewan looked in a really good position to win his first Tour de France stage right until the line, but it was Dylan Groenewegen who came flying up from about fifth or sixth place to nick the stage win, his fourth Tour de France stage win. Remember, he won the two most boring stages of last year's race into Chartres. and oh, what, an, what an accolade. And he also won on the Champs-Élysées in 2017. And so after Dylan turns yesterday... Dylan Groenewegen has won, and that leaves just Dylan Van Barla of Team Ineos, uh, the only Dylan who hasn't won a stage. He's obviously going to win tomorrow, isn't he? Well, he may well do. And as Francois mentioned, TJ Van Garderen was the victim of a crash, and uh, at the finish, I saw him come out of the EF Education First bus and uh, hobble into uh, a waiting van to be taken to the uh, the little x-ray cabin that is up at near the press room or near the finish line, one or the other. Uh, he had two big bandages on on his well one on each knee and some cuts and bruises on his elbows and one on one on his face so uh, we await to hear how he is but I mean he lost a fair packet of time on La Planche de Belfi yesterday so um, not it's not like he was you know uh, his overall um, chances are affected by that crash 
Overall, no change. Giulio Ciccone still in yellow by six seconds from Julian Alaphilippe. Sagan still in green. Wellen still in the King of the Mountains jersey. And Ciccone still in the white jersey, but it will be worn by Egan Bernal again tomorrow. The fastest closing in the World Tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as a partner EF Education First and Canyon Charam. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa, our headline sponsor and makers of the coveted Peddler de Charme range of cycling podcast clothing. Uh, the t-shirts, uh, we've uh, come to the Tour de France armed with a stock of Peddler de Charme t-shirts. So we'll be presenting the first one tomorrow. At the moment, it looks like it'll go to Michael Morkov, who is leading the poll. Although Tom Squinch has been uh, doing a bit of lobbying on his own behalf. Um, so that might make a difference. Who knows? Still about 12 hours to go, so if you are one of the early listeners to the podcast, you can still vote. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, the gap is closing. Uh, Morkov is on 53% and Squinge is on 30%. Ioana Fredo on 13% and Julian Simon on 4%. Uh, Alfredo may have uh, got a bit of a boost today out in front yet again. I mean, that's what he does, as he told you the other day, Francois. I did wonder if those two hadn't attacked... What would have happened? Because they went away, nobody really wanted to go with them. Maybe Alexis Gougeur and Oliver Nesson would have gone because that, they, 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 they kind of try. I mean, they tweet. I think uh, Gougeur tweeted, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, like an hour ago uh, about it. Like, like they, they, they were, they were, in, they were chasing, you know, counter attacking for like two or three k's, and obviously open for you know other guys to come with them and nobody did and and Gujar tweeted saying well Oliver and me thought it might be a good idea to join the the um, the break but uh, nobody seemed to have the same opinion so no uh, obviously everybody was nobody was 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 trying to do anything today and it was the, the usual I, I called them the breakaway addicts you know because that's what that's kind of what they are they they both Broke away uh, three times in this Tour de France. Now they they both actually uh, you know got the most uh, combative uh, trophy once. And uh, the, the interesting thing, I mean, it's been said before, but uh, is they they've known each, each other forever. Uh, Rossetto and uh, and Ofredo, they are they they both live in the you know in the area of Paris. They're both Parisians. They're they're both thirty two. They both you know rode together for a long time. They've known each other forever. They go on holidays together. So you you should think that maybe uh, you know at work they might they might want to 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 kind of spread a little bit. But no, you know, maybe spend maybe it. that's what they were doing, and they just yeah. couldn't find anywhere to stay. Yeah, <laughs> well, maybe maybe on holidays that's what they do. You know, they take their bikes and and go on a stroll together. Because it was not actually. The, it's not like they they tried hard to win the stage. I mean, the the pace. Okay, there was a head win, but for the first three hours, the the, the average speed was about thirty five kph. So it was not. And but once again, they they they've done that in the past. As I you know, I, I told you in the car, uh, they they used to do to 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 run you know in in, in duos uh, or trios. We, for, yeah, we we call them two up time trials and. Over here, it's duos, yeah. and there are a few kind of big two up time trials. Yeah, aren't there? so so the, they, they've done that from from a very young age. And the last I heard is that uh, Stefano Rossetto, uh, uh, you know, recently had a baby, and uh, and Johan Fredo will, will be the godfather. So I mean, you couldn't have you know closer closer friends uh, to to you know to to break away together. So that that was in a way it sums up the day. It was a sunny day in the countryside. You know, everybody. Kind of took it easy after a hard day in the mountains, and two guys, two friends, you know, went on on the leisurely uh, stroll uh, in 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 the in the, well, actually, almost in the vineyards now of the uh, Rhone region because we're going now. I, I I do a little Daniel correction there for uh, for Lionel because he, he referred to the, the Finnish town as Chalon sur Saône, where it's actually Chalon sur Saône, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I thought Daniel had told you, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's useful. Um, well, I mean, the the breakaway was really the only thing that happened. You mentioned TJ Van Garderen's crash, and it did look it did look nasty. He didn't have a great day uh, up to La Plonge de Belfi, and uh, you know he was flying below the radar a little bit coming into this race. Clearly in good form. Jonathan Vottas was telling us how relaxed he was, mm. um, and and that had been the key to him producing some good performances this year. And I think a lot of people, well, some people were maybe expecting 
uh, some some strong performances from him, but he looked pretty bashed up, didn't he? You, you saw him at yeah, the finish. Yeah, he did, yeah. Uh, yeah, but we don't know at the moment what the, the extent of his um, injuries are. Um, well, uh, that will probably come out in the wash a bit later on. But just a quick point on the breakaway, and people might be wondering, well, why was it only two riders? Why were they going so slowly at the start? Um, why didn't the peloton want to catch them at some point? And there's almost this kind of invisible deal isn't there between the break and the bunch if uh, well Rossetto and Alfredo only two of them they've that's an awful lot of time to spend on the front each of them basically they're looking at uh, 109 kilometers each on the front if they share the the work um, evenly and so there's a limit to how m- how much energy they're going to be able to put into that effort um, if they had gone harder and and tried to stretch the um, the lead out, all that would have happened would be the peloton would have gone harder as well to basically give them that that kind of uh, s- silent shout from behind that they're not going to be allowed off um, into the distance. And so you have this kind of dance that goes on between the brake and the peloton. And well, today was a, a quite a, you know a, <laughs> one for the purists, but quite an interesting example mm. of it because there was that hesitation for many kilometres I mean probably an hour uh, mm. maybe two hours well, where the bunch just refused to catch yeah. them Keep, keeping them on the leash as, as, as they say in the, in the, in the peloton's jargon because the, the, the idea is that you, you, you had three guys leading the peloton all day uh, you know a guy from the, the, the Conan Quick Step uh, Maxime Montfort from Lotto Soudal and uh, Tony Martin for uh, Jumbo Visma and uh, and obviously, the instructions you know they had in their in their ear all day was was to to to, to kind of pull the leash a little bit, you know, uh, 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 let it lose a little bit. The idea being, don't catch them because if you do catch them, there there'll be a counter attack and maybe more dangerous guys uh, going up front. So yeah. so 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 it was ideal for the peloton to have a relaxed day. Let these guys have their day, you know, and we we keep them within. Uh, reasonable distance, and then when when it's time to go to the serious business, which is bunch sprint, then we'll catch them, and that's what they did. But it is one for the purists, isn't it? It's a bit like watching a batsman at the crease not scoring any runs for hour after hour. I don't know but what you're, you know, don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but the, the it was a bunch sprint, and uh, Grinnell won one fastest sprinter we thought coming into the tour. So finally, he's got his win. Eli Viviani, stage winner already, had a perfect lead out. Um, Ricchese and Morkov again did, did a great job for him. Uh, we learned later that he had a, a soft tyre, um, so he finished sixth in the end. Uh, you know, that you can't really sprint with a tyre a that's losing air, so um, not perhaps at his best. Caleb Ewan was impressive. Um, and then the other sort of subplot was the, the, the goings on at, at UAE Team Emirates. Uh, Jasper Philipson, very young. Rider who we heard from the other day, Lionel, outside the team bus. And uh, Alexander Christoph, of course. Now, Christoph was 10th, Philipson was 5th, and they lost each other in the finale. I think Philipson went through a gap that Christoph couldn't or didn't go through. Much bigger, isn't he, for <laughs> Christoph? Um, but it was interesting that because, you know, he's a young rider learning the ropes, and presumably part of the, the education for him is, is to stick to that role of leading out. Christoph, he didn't do that today. It might not have been his own fault, uh, but there'll be interesting dynamics, I think, within that team politics and in in terms of how that ended up today. Um, he looked okay at the the finish. Christoph he didn't look annoyed or anything, so um, it may well it may well all be fine. But um, finishing fifth on a stage of the tour, age twenty one, in your first tour is pretty impressive, uh, and it, that will have caught a few people's eye. But the winner, of course, Dylan Grunewigen. Well, we hear a little bit from him and his sports director, Franz Massen, at Jumbo Visma. Uh, if I sprint to a Ewan, it's, uh, it's always really close, so I don't know why, but uh, yeah, he's a really good sprinter, and uh, I'd like it to, to sprint to him. But, uh, yeah, today we beat him, and I'm really happy with it. Uh, I'm really happy with the winner. After the first day, I was a little bit disappointed for myself. Uh, that was not what I expected, but, uh, but uh, yeah, today it was the third sprint stage, and uh, yeah, we take that victory. We work really hard uh, as, a, as a team to this moment, and yeah, today we realized it. Yeah, I'm really happy with the team, and they work very hard for me. After the last sprint, uh, they say, "No, we believe in you, and uh, you can do this." So we recovered some days, and yeah, today we did it. It's been a dream start to the Tour de France. The first week couldn't have gone any better, I guess. No, no, you can uh, you can say that. Yeah, we uh, we had two at two out of two, and uh, after that. Uh, 
a second place from Wout in a, also a hard stage. Yesterday was a bit, uh, yeah, we hoped a, li- a bit better, but uh, still okay because we know Stevie is in his best uh, the last week. So, but today, yeah, Dylan shows he's, he's yeah, maybe the fastest sprinter, I may say that. We probably can say that. Uh, what happened with Wout van Aert when, with around 30 kilometers to go, they were off the back and he had to, first of yeah, all, try to chase? Some guys went for bottles and uh, for pee and uh, after the sprint it broke a little bit and uh, yeah, then uh, he was uh, in the back. And uh, first he was pulling, but we said stop pulling because uh, Quintana is there. They will wait for Quintana and then uh, he was... Always perfect, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. always perfect. What about Steven yesterday? Because it's not necessarily the finish for yeah, him. It's not not really the, sp- the finish for him. He has to, has to go steady and uh, he's not the puncher. That, uh, that he cannot do. But uh, yeah, we have confidence. To, uh, we are confident that he still will be with the best riders uh, last week. Because obviously there's the one mountain stage very difficult, but in total isolation in the race. Now we have hilly stages flat stages next week we have the time trial before any real climbing again yeah but yeah okay we have to enjoy now and uh, we see for the plan for the next day we, we see the, the, the we evaluate the, uh, tonight and we see the plan for tomorrow and day by day we see see how it's going but for Stevie is one job you have to be good in the last week and uh, don't lose any time before then, uh, then it's great Shoot à l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast team car at the back of the pack, please. This episode of our Tour de France coverage is sponsored by the Watt Bike Atom. And, well, Richard, we've been riding the Watt Bike Atom before we came out to the Tour de France. And one of the things that uh, I got to grips with very quickly was the two uh, distinctive modes that the Atom has. Uh, it has an integrated gears mode, which is basically makes indoor riding very similar to outdoor riding. It's like having a bike with electric gears on it, isn't it? You just touch a button and change gear. Or you can use the Atom's Ergo mode, which sets the resistance for you depending on the program you're following and the design desired power output that you want to reach so you kind of don't really have to do anything other than concentrate on the pedaling and the power output so let's hear you in action so on we go there's a big a big lump in the profile coming up so it's like a sprint better get myself prepared for that physically and psychologically here goes silly me but I didn't know you could adjust the gear so my cadence has been a bit low and not my my gear has been high enough for these intervals so let's put it up a bit you learn something every day so on the brake levers I can adjust the gear this is a revelation oh that's brilliant so always read the instruction manual kids don't just wing it like me because you'll uh, waste, what, 17 minutes working out the equipment. But there we are, that's perfect. Now I can be my target cadence, whether it's a rest between the intervals or the interval itself. Here we go. If you want to be like Richard and ride a Watt Bike Atom, you can get one from wattbike.com and until July the 31st, every Watt Bike Atom purchased at wattbike.com will come with a £100 Sigma Sports voucher. To receive that offer, go to wattbike.com slash TCP100. That's TCP for the Cycling Podcast, 100 in numbers, 100, and use the code TCP100. Well, it's been a dream week for Jumbo Visma. They won the first two stages. They've had the yellow jersey. They've won again today. Um, the only small hiccup was Stephen Kralsweig on um, La Planche de Belfi. And as we heard from Franz Masson there, maybe they would have liked a little bit more from him. But that's probably the climb that suits him least in this whole tour. And, uh, well, as Masson says, the job is to be good in the final week. Um, but uh, Groenewegen... Well, we thought he was uh, nailed on favourite to win on the opening day in Brussels, and perhaps he would have done had it not been for that crash. Yeah, and uh, I actually looked... Well, I mean, it was an impressive performance by Grunewagen. I mean, he, he looked badly, 
you know, hurt actually in the, in, in his crash on, on, on day one. Uh, I Obviously, his goal was to win and take the yellow jersey. It was a great opportunity for sprinters to do that. Well, it, it was actually, it, it was in the family because Mike Tunison did. And he, he recovered quite quickly, which is uh, impressive. In, in the last sprint, okay, he finished fifth, I think, but it, it was, it, there was actually, you know, he was kind of blocked inside the the the, 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 the bunch and couldn't do anything, but it looked uh, it looked good and um, and today he won and which prompted me to to uh, have a look at the, the you know the other Dutch sprinters who had won stages th- in three different tours in the past and while I was looking at these stats something struck me it may be a Dutch speciality winning sprints in the most boring stages in the tour because <laughs> if you look at Dylan von Grun- <laughs> Grunewagen in the last couple of years his stage win let's face it were also uh, in, in those you know uh, long 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 days in the sun uh, and at the end of it you, you have the, this kind of a shot of adrenaline when he actually wins and in the past uh, 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 Jeroen Blylevens did was also uh, could I say a sprinter who won boring stages and let's face it gave boring press conferences from time to time and and it, and even before that remember Jean Paul van Poppel he was a great sprinter of course but he, he was the epitome of the, the the rider you know when the Tour de France first week was all about long transition stages and long boring stages Jean Paul van Poppel was the pope of the sprint so maybe you know a Dutch speciality if the stage is boring, you have a Dutchman winning the sprint in the finale. An interesting theory. An interesting <laughs> theory, certainly. Um, well, today was the first day in yellow for Giulio Cicconi, the young rider, Trek Segafredo, who had such a great Giro and has come to the Tour. Quite unusual for such a young rider, actually, to, to do two uh, Grand Tours back-to-back. But he's in the yellow jersey. Uh, he did say he felt a bit tired today. Um, but it's a real boost for a team Trek Segafredo that that has struggled a little bit and, and had a great Giro and I think you know that 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 helped the team immeasurably but they, they come into this race with Richie Port as their leader um, and uh, you know Jasper Stuyven is a a decent bet for some stages he, get, he gets up there in the top 10 in sprints uh, without being a pure sprinter um, so I spoke to one of their riders Cohen de Court the sort of veteran domestique on that team who's, who's been around several teams and uh very close in the past, John Denkall, Marcel Kittel, riders like that. Uh, he'll have a, a big job to do helping defend that yellow jersey. So I spoke to him at the finish today. How was today? A long, a long day out there. Yeah, um, it's actually a bit boring at one point. Um, probably shouldn't complain too much about that because it's probably not going to be very boring the next couple of days. So um, try to enjoy it as much as we could. Of course, riding around with the yellow jersey in your team and you know these yellow helmets and yellow numbers on the back it's not too bad yeah how was last night a bit, a bit of a celebration uh we definitely drank a glass of champagne but uh yeah the work's not done yet so uh not uh, not too much celebrating but um, you know we'll uh keep the jersey now and hopefully uh we can keep it a little longer after that but you know we still have some goals uh, in uh, the final gc as well well, I mean, what's it like for uh, a team? You come in with a, a, a very specific plan. You've got a leader in Richie. Jasper has been going for a bunch of sprints as well. I guess yesterday was completely unexpected. Um, yeah, kind of unexpected. But on the other hand, you know, having Richie and Bauke so good in GC, it's always good to have good climbers in the front as well in the breakaway. First of all, they can go for their own results, and second, you know, if anything happens or you know the race is open really early and it's just the leaders left. Then you always still have uh, one or two guys in the front who can drop back to help out. Uh, Rich is your leader, obviously. Um, there's been a lot of pressure and expectation on him for many years. What does it do to the team and, and perhaps for him as well to have this sort of early success of having the yellow jersey in the in the in, in the in the team? It's something that a lot of teams would would would, would settle for at the tour. No, absolutely. I think it's uh, it's really good for him. It's really good for the team. You know, it gives a uh, sort of like a, a good uh, a good atmosphere in the team already with the riders, with the staff, uh, management, sponsors, everyone, and uh, I think for Richie himself as well. It just uh, you know it, it kind of calms him down. I think you know we uh, we have a right to sit up there at the front of the bunch. People take us into account, and um, I think he showed already in uh, Plunge de Belfia that he's in good shape. And what do you know about Julio? He's a young guy, rode a very well Giro. Do you know him? Do you know him well? Um, well, obviously, uh, 
I've uh, seen him in uh, in a couple of races and uh, done like training camps and that sort of stuff with him. Um, awesome guy. Yeah, really funny. Um, might need a little calming down, but that probably will come with age. He's bouncing off the walls, but uh, that's uh, that's a good character to have in the team as well. I guess uh, we know him as a very attacking, aggressive rider. That's what won him the King of the Mountains at the Giro. In the yellow jersey, he'll have to ride in a completely different way. Um, possibly, but then again, you saw yesterday that he didn't have to. So uh, it really comes down to how the race develops. Um, he might have another chance or two, but uh, indeed maybe he needs to sacrifice his own chances sometimes to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that, that the GC for, uh, for Richie is protected. But I'm sure that he's uh, more than willing to do that too. Well, it was Cone de Court of Trek Sigurdfried. Let's hear briefly from the yellow jersey, Giulio Ciccone. Uh, it's very difficult. Six seconds is nothing, but... Uh, and also tomorrow we, uh, we will be we'll be a very hard stage, long and hard stage. So for me it's important to recover well this night and uh, tomorrow we will see. So I think with the yellow jersey it will be very, very, very hard. Maybe impossible to go in the break, with, but uh, I don't know. So Ciccone makes the point that six seconds means almost nothing and uh, well with the time bonus that's available on some of these final climbs uh, on the stages that's certainly true tomorrow on the run into Saint Etienne the Côte de Jalier Jalier Côte no, de Jal Jal Jalier I think Jalier 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 <laughs> the final climb, <laughs> third category climb, there's a, a time bonus at the top, which if, if the bunch is all together and Alaphilippe can take it, then that would put him, put him back in the yellow jersey. And of course there's um, seconds on the line as well, but you know we wouldn't necessarily anticipate Ciccone being involved in that sprint, but Alaphilippe might be. So um, yeah, there's a, it's up for grabs really. The Cycling Podcast at the 2019 Tour de France is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Yes, Science in Sport, a long-time sponsor and supporter of the Cycling Podcast now. You can get 25% off with the code SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. Also head to scienceandsport.com forward slash sign up to uh, enter a competition with an incredible prize to spend a day at the Vuelta or the Tour of Britain in the Team Ineos team car. It includes two nights accommodation, transport and £400 spending money. Runners-up prizes are pretty tasty as well. Um, and uh, yes, great a great prize offered by Science and Sport. Go to scienceandsport.com forward slash sign up. Now, um, I spoke at the finish to Geraint Thomas, the defending champion, who had a very good day at La Plonge de Belfi. I think surprised a lot of people, including himself. Here's what he said 24 hours later. Yeah, it was okay. It was just a, a long, slow day in the saddle, really, you know, with the headwind and um, or head cross, whatever. But uh, oh, it's a long day. Every good thing was just starting to ache by the end, your, your wrists and your feet and stuff. But uh, yeah, I guess it's better than uh, 230k and a full-on crosswind, so... You know, for sure, everyone thinks it's a breakaway day, so it's going to be a big fight for that. Probably still be going by the time we hit the first climb, so it's going to be a hard start for sure. And then, uh, yeah, I may settle down and the break might go then, but uh, it depends, numbers and everything. But, uh, yeah, I think the next two days will be certainly tough. How did your fight last night, Geraint, on yesterday's stage? You must have been pretty happy. Yeah, um, I didn't really know what to expect going there, but... Um, yeah, I felt good, and uh, yeah, it was nice to finish ahead of all GC guys. You've not made an effort on a climb like that, I guess, since the tour last year almost, in, in a race at least, because you know so many races have been interrupted. But um, was there nervousness before that stage about just how you'd, you'd respond when the, you know, especially on that final climb? Yeah, I was just a bit uh, didn't know where I'd be really compared to everyone. I knew I was he was going well, and you take confidence from that, but still there's that in the back of your mind you don't exactly know how everyone else is but um yeah i think uh it was certainly a good day especially on a climb which wouldn't necessarily be my ideal climb you know you think be more suited to the pure climbers so yeah it was a good day did anyone else catch your eye impress you on the climb uh pino obviously um i heard he's, he's from around there anyway he knew it really well i think he timed his effort really well ala philippe obviously still super strong and then everyone else is just sort of there or thereabouts, so it's hard to say really, it's still early doors, so uh, 
Yeah, we'll see. Well, talking to British riders and Shalon Sur Soon. 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 Yeah. <laughs> um, well, talking of British riders and Shalon Sur Soon. It's not too bad, yeah. Oh, thank you. Soon. <laughs> Soon. Soon. Um, yeah, that was good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 60 years ago, uh, Brian Robinson won in the Finnish town that we visited today. Um, <laughs> with, he was riding for the Luxembourg Mixed National Team, uh, a, a British rider. Well, there weren't so many British riders doing the tour in those days. Um, Robinson had been the first British rider to win a tour stage the previous year, 1958, but in 59 uh, he won... a with a solo break it was a third from last stage it, it came all the way from Annecy uh, as they headed up towards Paris at the end of the race and uh, he won by around 20 minutes uh, and, you, and you know what happened that day because of Brian Robinson's uh, victory and he had, it had actually been uh, reinstated in the race the day before uh, after missing the time cut but that day Jean Robic the guy who won the 1947 uh, tour in Chalon sur the, hob, the hobgoblin of the Brittany Moor, <laughs> yes, as, as he was known. Absolutely, he, he, he missed the time cut and he was kicked out of the race. It was its last day on the tour. Wow, so mm. Robinson <laughs> got the benefit of the doubt one day and, yeah, and the Robic yeah. out, out of the race the Absolutely, amazing. Gosh. Well, there we are. Good, good knowledge, Francois. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Um, are we going to hear the exciting feature? Outside the team bus. Yes, I headed to... Well, we'll find out. <laughs> Outside the team bus, with... Dylan Turns by Ren Marida. Dylan, how did you sleep last night? Uh, okay, but uh, I had the shortest night uh, <laughs> the, the last couple of days. Why was that? <laughs> because of the emotions, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't. I couldn't uh, get uh, into sleep. Like, uh, take me a while. And uh, yeah, after uh, once I was asleep, I had a uh, good night. But normally I can sleep pretty long. But at eight, uh, I was clearly awake again. Is that because the tour is just so overwhelming? There's so much going on. Uh, that's that's a part of that. Uh, I think it's more of the emotions from the victory and. Uh, Still, the adrenaline was going into your body. Are you aware that it was the first Tour de France stage win for Bahrain Merida since they started as a sponsor? Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, not before, but afterwards uh, they told me, yes. So what was the reaction last night around the dinner table? Did you celebrate, have a glass of champagne? Yeah, if everybody came late in the hotel, so it was a pretty busy evening. That's a bit sad, also because of the traffic to going down to mountain but overall we had uh, a small celebration and uh, for sure everybody was super happy and did you ring friends family talk to them about the day my my family was here so uh, this uh, i saw already really quick behind uh, uh, i mean after the the stage went and also yeah friends texted me and uh, called me uh, was uh, pretty busy you said in the press conference that you learned something in the Vuelta last year when you lost to Michael Woods. What did you learn? To don't overreact, like uh, to stay calm, actually. So you waited for the perfect moment? I tested it a couple of times between uh, 500 and uh, 250 to go, and then at uh, 150 I went full gas. Did you know that Ciccone was going to get the yellow jersey? Did that make you think that maybe you had a better chance for the stage? Uh, I, I knew I was aware of this, but uh, in the end, he wanted to go also for the stage win. So, uh, yeah, and he almost didn't made it. So uh, he only kept it by six seconds. So, uh, yeah, if I was him, I would ride faster up the hill. So he was a bit more sure. <laughs> but basically the two of you were side by side at one point were you confident uh i was uh, confident about myself but i knew he was also a strong guy to beat so it was uh was not uh, an easy day i was pretty nervous and stressful in these last moments and last couple of questions um your third overall at the moment this this result has kind of been coming this year. You did very well in the Dauphiné, won a stage and finished sixth. But the Tour de France is all new for you. So what are your ambitions now for the rest of the race? Yeah, it's all new. Uh, and uh, I know I'm, I'm pretty good up there. But 
Yeah, it's not a goal to make uh, uh, a top 10 GC. Uh, I think uh, maybe later uh, I will try this, uh, but not now yet. A bit later in your career, maybe. Yes. Um, and finally, the Grand Depart in Brussels with Eddie Merckx. I mean, how special was that? Uh, first of all, Eddie is the greatest of all. And uh, yes, uh, the Grand Depart in Brussels was amazing. Also, to start my first tour in home country, in the capital city of, of the country, was uh, pretty amazing. Well, that was Dylan Turns, a winner. Um, so that's Barry Merida ticked off now, Lionel, as you mm. as you work your way through the teams. Seven so, down. Uh, I'm quite impressed that this is uh, yeah. Uh, this mm. is still oh, rolling. I'm so I, w- I was glad to see on Twitter a couple of our listeners, you know, that were not too shocked by my silly pun on Dylan Tunes, and who suggested Dylan Tunes uh, to go with the tour, you know. Uh, so well, that, that's interesting. Dylan Tunes, yeah, keep your Dylan Tunes, tunes coming. coming. coming and, and, and talking about song, I I I, I learned today about the. Uh, well, the family links uh, between uh, Giulio Ciccone and Madonna, there are none. Well, <laughs> they, they, they actually, uh, Madonna's family came from a small village, 50 k from the town where Giulio Ciccone comes from. So they might be distant uh, rela- relatives. So, uh, but apparently Giulio Ciccone l- likes to hint that there might be a link, but uh, we don't know. I mean, he's too young for Madonna, <laughs> surely. Francois, you had some uh, some juicy transfer speculation well, not, gossip. Yeah, not not that juicy, but it's about you know I I I thought about I thought about it when I saw that Rossetto and uh, Alfredo were together. Uh, th- there's obviously lots you know going on at Wanty Gobert because Alfredo himself, who, r- who writes for our Wanty Gobert, is, is said to be going to Israel uh, Academy. So next season, who knows? I mean, it, it looks pretty serious. We'll see. And Guillaume Martin, who is the, the leader of uh, Wanty Gobert on the tour, would be going to Cofidis, which is Stefano Rossetto team. Um, it seems quite... Se- well, I don't know about Alfredo for sure, but uh, Guillaume Martin's move look, looks quite definite. So obviously, Cedric Vasser is working hard to have a strong team next season with uh, Elia Viv- Viviani announced as a sprinter and Guillaume Martin as a GC leader. We'll see. Listen, before we go tonight, we should mention uh, our latest Kilometer Zero, which was uh, uh, well, the first part of a, a two-part conversation with David Walsh, the Sunday Times journalist, who, of course, 20 years ago came to the tour and was dogged in his pursuit of Lance Armstrong and, and did more than any other journalist to expose Armstrong's doping. It's a fascinating two-part conversation. Part one came out today. And uh, yeah, that's on your on your regular feed. Thanks to Hans Grower Showers and Taps for sponsoring uh, Kilometer Zero. Another shout out for our show at Harrogate at the World Championships on the Friday evening. Go to thecyclingpodcast.com, click on live events down the, the side of the page to uh, click through to get your tickets for our event in Harrogate. Well, as we're in the Burgundy region, Francois, I'm assuming snails will be on the menu for you. Well, I haven't even had a look at, at the menu, so there might not be, but, but we're in Givry, and Givry is a very nice place for wine anyway, so uh, I'm not sure about the snails, but what I'm sure of is that we're going to drink Givry wine tonight. Before we go, um, Francois, you met a couple of podcast listeners in this the village we were staying in a couple of, well, yesterday in Kaisers, morning. In Kaisersburg, yeah. yeah. Um, they'd come there because they'd heard about it on the podcast, which was nice, and they came to, to see it, and we met them by our by our car uh, you rashly promised he, he did the listener did say that he would was was poised to sign up as a friend of the podcast you convinced him to do so and um, but you did rashly promise him that if he did so we'd read out his name on uh, on on the podcast now we've got a problem there because he tweeted to say that he, he has signed up but from his twitter handle it wasn't clear what his name is so we're going to just have to read out all the recent sign-ups <laughs> uh, as friends of the podcast and hope that we get him <laughs> because a promise is a promise that's after right all. Um, anyway so thank you to Cornelia Bruckner Philip Grinhaf that might be him Paul Diet, John Scullion John Simpson a big thank you to James Phillips William Russell Matt Maciek John Johnson and Timothy Sevitt and a big thank you to Clive Fenn, Donald Fitchmorris, Stuart Storr, and Brian. I don't know what N stands for, but Richard Wools and Richard Given. Thank you very much, Francois. 
Thank you very much, Richard. À demain. À demain. Thank you, Lionel. Thanks, Richard.